Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and welcome to this week's edition of the Perry Report with Bob Poland, who now joins us from Amherst, Massachusetts. Bob is the co-founder and co-director of the Perry Institute. Thanks for joining us again, Bob. Very happy to be on. Thank you, Paul. So what are you following this week? Okay, so uh, very interesting set of studies uh, about conditions in state and local government finances. That is, we have started to see some improvement in state and local revenues. That is, their tax revenues are going up, getting to the point at which they're close to where they were in 2007 before the recession. Uh, at the same time, however, their costs, in particular their health care costs that, that they have to bear uh, through uh, Medicaid especially, have been rising very rapidly. And so that even uh, though their revenues are going up, they're going to face increased, continued ongoing increased deficits because of this increase in their costs, because of people uh, who need health care uh, who qualify for Medicaid. Now, uh, over the, uh, the first phase of the recession, when we had the stimulus program, state and local government finances got bailed out by federal government uh, revenue sharing, including my own institution here, University of Massachusetts. Uh, uh, to date, there is nothing in any federal program and there is no talk in the fiscal cliff about giving state and local governments more funding, more support, quite the reverse. The idea is that state and local governments are not going to get a dime from the federal government uh, through the uh, agreement that goes into place with the onset of the fiscal cliff. So that state and local governments are going to remain strapped uh, and they aren't going to have any backstop. So that means the kinds of cuts that we have seen for education, uh, for teachers, for public safety, for uh, health care, other than Medicaid, those things are going to have to continue to get cut unless there is more federal spending. So again, the state and local government situation is going to be uh, getting more and more severe, even though we've got this short respite with revenues going up. Now, is this partly because more people are on Medicaid because they've lost jobs that had insurance connected to them? Yeah, there's two things going on. Number one, of course, people have lost their jobs. Uh, people have uh, fallen below the threshold that qualifies them because their incomes have gone down, their family incomes have gone down. And we're, we're talking about five years now. So population has just gone up uh, over that five years. We can't maintain a given level of revenue when population is going up. Uh, so that the combination means that the gap between uh, what the government is getting in revenue, the, the state and local governments, and what they need to cover to help people that qualify for Medicaid, uh, that gap is growing. Now, what, what is the real answer here? The real answer is, of course, that the, the United States still spends uh, uh, grotesquely, uh, uh, grotesque amounts more than other countries on healthcare, and we get worse results. Uh, so uh, that's really at the bottom of the issue, and until we squeeze out the uh, a trillion dollars or so in our healthcare system that goes to administrative costs, that goes to pharmaceutical companies, that has no equivalence in other Western countries that are paying half as much per person. For example, the United States pays about $8,000 per person on healthcare. Uh, Germany, France um, uh, spend about 4,000. Canada spend about 4,000. Japan spends about 3000 and they get better outcomes in terms of life expectancy and overall uh, measures of care. And the reason is we're wasting about a trillion dollars on the administrative system, the private insurance system, and the pharmaceutical system, and uh, excessive numbers of expensive tests. All of those contribute to the ongoing long-term crisis in healthcare, and we're not going to solve it until we confront those. Things. And I guess if you're gonna talk about grotesque expenditure compared to the rest of the world, I guess you can not ignore military expenditure as well as the states and cities get into deeper crisis. The one thing that's sure to come out of the fiscal cliff negotiations is that they're gonna make sure the military cuts are not as serious as, as might be triggered. 
Right. Well, that certainly has been established. I mean, officially on January 1st, military spending gets cut equal to the amount of social spending. But there really isn't an equivalence here because the military budget um, now at 4.7% of GDP versus 3% of GDP in, not, in 2000 has grown uh, by about $300 billion. Um, and you could say, well, that was because we had to fight two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq. Well, we're not fighting those wars anymore. So it makes perfect sense that at the very least, we bring the military budget down uh, from 4.7 to 3% of GDP. Uh, that is, we squeeze out that $300 billion or so. Whereas in the case of social spending, uh, again, we're not getting better health care. We've laid off teachers. We've laid off public safety workers, and therefore the money uh, needs to go back into those areas, not into the military. At the same time, what the real scuttlebutt in Washington is, in reality, uh, they're not really going to end up cutting the military. That's the first priority. Uh, they've got some wording in the language of the, um, uh, the, the, the fiscal cliff agreement, which allows the, spend, the spending cuts to shift disproportionately over to social spending as opposed to military spending. Mm. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. And thanks for joining us on The Real News Network. Don't forget, we're just about at our target of the matching grant campaign. There's a donate button over here. Thanks for joining us on The Real News Network.